and thank you for accommodating our time crunch that we're facing. From a regional look at Asia, we now go into Malaysian capitalism. And to present that, we have none other than Malaysia's celebrity economist, Professor Jomo Kwame Sundaram. He holds the Tun Hussein Chair in International Studies at the Institute of Strategic and International Studies, Malaysia. He's a visiting senior fellow at Kazana Research Institute and visiting fellow at the Initiative for Policy Dialogue, Columbia University. He was awarded the 2007 Wassily Leontief Prize for Advancing the Frontiers of Economic Thought. He's held many important posts in the UN and at the World, um, at the Food and Agricultural Organization. And today, he will present Malaysian Capitalism and Development in Comparative Perspective. Professor Sundram. Thank you very much, Chaco. Excellence, uh, Monsieur and Madame, friends all, thank you for your presence here and your interest in the subject of our discussion today. I think it would be remiss of me, however, not to thank uh, Dr. Elsa Lafay de Monsieur and Dr. Char Charon Magzani for the initiative. I frankly did not expect this to succeed, so thank you. Um, I have very little time, so I will rush through quite a number of issues. I think, it's I think the, to begin with, I should say that I don't belong particularly to the school which has been making its presentations today, Professor Petit and Pre Professor uh, uh, Le Chevalier. Uh, but I think it's very important for us to recognize that uh, capitalism is very much part of our lives. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, one of the puzzles today is that um, very few people actually study capitalism in Malaysia. It's taken for granted. It's like the air we breathe, uh, almost. And this, I think, is problematic. And therefore, I think it might be useful, uh, if we can, uh, uh, no, no, it's the wrong one. It's the wrong slideshow. Uh, OK, um, it's the wrong slideshow. It's, it's the wrong slideshow. It's the wrong slideshow. Mr. Morris. <laughs> okay, can I, can I, can I uh, l l let's, uh, let's see whether they can get, get this part right. But I think it's important to recognize that a lot of our discussions and understandings of capitalism uh, begin often with a binary uh, uh, premise. So you have uh, sort of developed versus underdeveloped, uh, core versus periphery, uh, integrated versus dependent, industry versus agriculture. Uh, for this versus post for this, or uh, alternatively bloody Taylorist and so on and so forth. This is one type of analysis which is very common, it's very convenient, it's, uh, this is binary analysis. The second type of analysis which is very common, very, very influential, is more structuralist. And here you have uh, the strong influence, for example, in the social sciences of what is called structural functionalism, you have the analysis of modes of production and uh, uh, so on associated with Louis Althusser. Uh, you have uh, uh, De Bruyne's uh, general equilibrium theory, which is all basically inspired by a philosophical structuralism. And then you have an alternative approach, which is more, more Taoist, if you will, Aristotelian, uh, which I would consider to be dialectical. It helps us to understand history. Now, uh, next, next please. Um, now, I think it's useful for us uh, in this context to think that, to rem remind ourselves that people have been thinking about capitalism for a long time, uh, partly because we live with it, and this has led to various different ways of, one of the, uh, this presentation today is very biased towards uh, France, and one of the very influential uh, um, uh, French, early French contributions, of course, is associated with what is called physiocracy. And this is to, to the, the analog of society and societal change was uh, the, the, phys the natural world, the, the, agri the agrarian world. And so you, and this I think is very important because there has been a revival recently after earlier decades of using the analogies of physics to an engineering, now there has been a return 
to much more biological models of understanding how economies function. And I think it's useful for us to remember that. The second point I want to make is that in a lot of uh, the f discussion, including the French discussion, you have a certain equation of markets with capitalism. That basically capitalism is about markets. You find this, for example, in the discussions of Braudel and all his followers. Uh, you in Francois Perrault's work, uh, there's a spatial, strong spatial dimension, and this was influential in the work of many other people, including very uh, severe critics of capitalism itself, people like Samir Amin, like Kyu Samfan, and so on and so forth. All this is, uh, assumes an association, and for many people, capitalism is the market. And a, th a third uh, point I'd like to make is to remember that 1776 represents, in a sense, the beginning of a big divide in capitalism. You have, on the one hand, Adam Smith publishing his Wealth of Nations, but you also have a young man uh, by the name of uh, Alexander Hamilton, the son of a prostitute from the, from the Caribbean, who comes to what is now Columbia University, studies there, drops out of the university, and joins George Washington in the revolution. And, and Alexander Hamilton basically is the first person, in my view, who begins to think about the challenges of national capitalism. And Frederick List, almost three quarters of a century later, begins to think of, of the challenges of, of national capitalism. And he writes a book called The Principles of Natural, National Economy, which is vastly different of a book from his earlier book, a decade earlier, called Principles of Natural Economy. So this, this evolution in, in, in list thinking, and I think that for many of us who live in post-colonial societies, it's much more useful to think about capitalism in terms of the challenges of building national capitalism. Hamilton was preoccupied with a huge number of issues, most of which he never uh, managed to deal with in his lifetime with. Many of you know the story of uh, Mr. Dick Cheney shooting his friend. Well, Hamilton was killed by the vice president, the sitting vice president of the United States at that time. He challenged him to a duel. In those days, when you, when you had a duel, you basically shot into the air, but the vice president of the United States shot him and killed him. And because it was a duel, he, he, you know, nothing happened to the vice president. So I, this is just pre remind you, since tomorrow is the election day in the United States, <laughs> Um, what, so there's a long tradition of, 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 what, uh, of, of many of these issues. But if you come back to the question of, of Hamilton versus Smith, you have two very different conceptions of capitalism, of how, cap, of how economic systems function from a very early stage. Now, let me move very, very fast forward to a more contemporary situation where you have had since the 19th century into the 20th century, a view that one of the major problems of capitalism is the inadequate aggregate demand, what, we, what Keynesians call inadequate aggregate demand, under consumption, theories of underconsumption. Now, this is very different from what is now being revived by people, surprisingly, pe people like Larry Summers, who talks about a tendency for the profit rate to fall and as a Consequences of that, a tendency for, for investments to decline and a tendency for the growth rate to, to go down, and hence his secular stagnation thesis. Now, this is a very important view about problems of capitalism, which I think many, of, many people do not recognize the historical roots of this, of this discussion. Yet another view is the emphasis on institutions, which some of our colleagues have already talked about, but I want to emphasize in particular the whole question of order. So we hear today, it's very fashionable today to be a libertarian capitalist. You know, you talk as if states don't matter. I can assure you that there are very, there's almost no capitalist system which has been viable where states don't matter. Of course, states can play very, very different roles, but states always matter, and it's a pretense to delude ourselves into thinking that states don't matter. This is fundamental to our understanding of, cap of capitalism. 
So order is important. It's not law and order, it's order and law. Law comes in precisely because you're trying to, to, to ensure order. And this is where Oliver, uh, the people like Douglas North had played a very important role. The whole question of property rights was seen as very central. So here you have a very different view, not the view of market as being central, but property rights as being central to capitalism and the institutions associated with, the re, uh, with uh, property rights being very, very crucial. Yet, and related to this, of course, is this view which we have now in law where we talk, we talk about how rights, a rights-based approach. What, do, what does a rights-based approach mean? You can have upholding property rights or you can have upholding human rights. And these are very fundamentally different views of society. And this is why this simple appeal to a rights-based approach and, and, and avoiding this distinction between property and, and human rights is fundamentally problematic. Now, you can see this, for example, in, in the Chicago schools, uh, 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 Richard Posner and Guido Calabresi from Yale Law School, a student of, uh, the teach, a teacher of, of the two Clintons. Um, and you have a different take of this from some of the students of Bourdieu, Pierre Bourdieu, uh, uh, people like Desalais, for example, who has written very interestingly about uh, this. The last point, person I'd like to mention in this regard is uh, offers yet another view of capitalism, and this is the emphasis on the relations of production. And this is Charles Bettelheim. If you look at the work of Charles Bettelheim, this is fundamental to his understanding of capitalism and the antithesis to capitalism. What is distinct about socialism for Charles Bettelheim in his critique of, of, of the, what happened in the Soviet Union is precisely, precisely the whole question of, of the relations of production. Why I'm saying all this is because we actually have very different views of what defines and distinguishes capitalism, uh, and this, I think, is very important for us to remind ourselves of. If I may move on, thank you. Uh, now, with Keynes, with the Great Depression of the 1930s, we had a recognition that capitalism needs to be managed. Capitalism needs to be saved from itself. Capitalism does not ensure uh, a, a sustainable equilibrium, if you will. And this is where, in a sense, the regulation school comes in also. A building on this on this perspective, which you see most popularly in the work of people like uh, Galbraith, for example, the, the, the senior Galbraith, Ken, Ken Galbraith, you see the, the, the regulation school emerging in the 60s and 70s, well, emerging in the English language a bit later, as, as usual, uh, and a recognition about the challenges of managing. And this comes out of, of course, from France, partly out of the experience of Gaullism. Well, I've been told I've got five minutes left. Um, I thought I just started, but uh, um, this is going to be a big challenge because I have about uh, quite a number of slides to go. Okay, let me try. Uh, I think, in particularly as far as Keynes is concerned, I think you have the, pro the, the, the question of, of, of uh, a recognition uh, that capitalism is not necessarily rational. The assumption of rational expectations and or rational choice if you uh, and so on is a, is, is, is a problematic assumption. And so Robert Schiller, for example, was, was uh, his work was recognized in a, in a field which he has pioneered the whole question of behavioral finance. Um, so this view, uh, I think, well, I've, I've, I made this point earlier. Let me, let me move to something which I, I've done a little bit of work on myself and uh, together with people like Mushtaq Khan and others. The, the, I, understanding rents differently. I think if we begin to recognize that economic systems basically generate surpluses, a surplus beyond your, your substances, subsistence requirements, that basically is, a, is in a sense so a biological surplus and potentially a social surplus. So the question then is how is that surplus uh, d distributed? Now in conventional economics you are told that basically you have a competitive system uh, 
and that you do that anything which exceeds a rate of return constitutes a rent. It can be due to some kind of intervention, some kind of producer surplus, it could be a consumer surplus, it could be a surplus due to resources of, or privilege access to resources, it could be due to some kind of information discrepancies, people like uh, Akalov, uh, Stiglitz and, and, and Spence and so on and so forth. There are different ways of looking at it, but ultimately it leads to what the, the management guru, uh, uh, Michael Porter, refers to as competitive advantage. So competitive advantage basically defines one's access to a, ex, a higher rate of profit. Now, what is the basic ethos of capitalism? The basic ethos is to maximize your profits. So by definition almost, maximizing your profits means seeking rents. Okay? And this is a f fundamental, it seems such an obvious insight, but this is the way a capitalist system functions. And so rent-seeking behavior is actually fundamental to understanding how capitalism works. And so we, when we, 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 if we de move the term rent-seeking behavior away from just being a pejorative term, because it's a polite way of describing corruption, etc., etc., and try to understand it analytically, you begin to realize that this is basically at the very heart of capitalism itself. And this, I think, is a very important challenge. Now, there are a number of other issues which I unfortunately don't have a, a, a chance to, to elaborate on. I, I think it is very important to, to recognize uh, the last line of, of this particular slide is that there have been very, very interesting ways of looking at capitalism comparatively in important ways. Now, uh, the late uh, Suru Shigeto was a student of, 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 of uh, Schumpeter. He took the idea of creative destruction and developed the idea of creative defeat. So Japanese capitalism post-war comes out of the, of the an opportunity created by the defeat during World War II and a sympathetic regime coming in the context of the Cold War and the ab ability to, 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 to emerge therefore. And consider the alternative. What happens during, during uh, uh, Yeltsin? Yeltsin rises, the, 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 the US sees the opportunity, you have a particular tr uh, a treatment of, the tr of that particular transition resulting in the collapse of the Soviet Union and the halving of the size of the Russian economy. Russia's economy halved in the four years uh, after, the, after the end of the collapse of the Cold War, and it only came back to the size it was before the, the collapse of the Berlin Wall just two years ago, or three years ago, sorry, the, yeah, 2013. So this, I think, is very, very important because you have very, you know, you have these mindless suggestions that all you need is, you know, a, a quick, but pay, uh, it's painful, but there's no gain without pain. So let's quickly move and, and, and so on and so forth. There's no recognition of transitional costs, which are very dis different from so-called transaction costs. And this, I think, is very important. Now, next, okay. Obviously, I don't have time to go through all this, but I think it is very important that embedded in all these different approaches to understanding development, to understanding the challenges of contemporary development, are basically a whole series of issues which have are basically assume very different views of, of capitalism. And I just want to, 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 to flag the last two because many people don't recognize that the view which was popularized by the former uh, Okita Saburo, the former uh, Japanese foreign minister, the flying geese view, actually comes from a man named Akamatsu. Akamatsu was the first, the founding dean of the Hitotsubashi School of Modern Economics. And he basically develops this whole idea of, 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 um, of, of how Japan was to, to, to develop. And then he began to think about Japan as one of the geese who would eventually move to the lead geese position. So he has a very dynamic view of capitalism.
And basically, he, at that time, when Akamatsu was developing his ideas, he was not thinking of, he was thinking of Japan moving up to a lead geese position in some far point in the future. But Okita basically saw it as a, began to popularize it as a way of getting East Asia behind Japanese capitalism and seeing that as the future for, for, for capitalism. So you can see how ideas and views of development and views of capitalism can be used for political and diplomatic and other purposes, as um, Mrs. Clinton did when she became Secretary of State. If you read her speech about the three Ds, diplomacy, development, and defense, when she first became Secretary of State. It was a remarkable speech because you have an understanding of the world and the integrated character and the multifaceted character of the challenges of contemporary capitalism. Now, I don't have time to get into uh, details. Uh, can I skip two slides, please? Okay. This is a very, very quick outline about what the nature of capitalism, of, of, of uh, the, the different phases in Malaysian capitalism are. And, uh, I, and I don't have time to elaborate on them now, but let me just quickly make, make a number of points. Next, please. Okay. I think it's very important to recognize the fundamental inferiority of Southeast Asian capitalism compared to Northeast Asian capitalism. And I would say that the main difference is that we don't have our capitalist class. What is capitalism without a capitalist class? Okay. This is the problem. Now, in the past, in the first post-colonial generations, when they recognized this, they said, okay, if there's no capitalist class or this capitalist class is incompetent, or as Gunda Frank put it, it's a lumpen bourgeoisie, what you do then is that the state takes over that role. So the whole role of the state, of state capitalism within that context becomes very crucial. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a non-capitalist path to development. It's a state capitalist path to development. But it's, it's an, so the question then, the challenge then becomes that of trying to understand how you ensure that these guys who are running your, uh, as the World Bank put it, the bureaucrats in business, how these guys do not lose sight of their mission. And this has been the challenge for state capitalism since then. And this is how, why Kaletsky, for instance, when he talks about, about India and a number of other post-colonial regimes, talks about them as intermediate regimes, not unlike the Bonapartist regimes of the mid-19th century, where you have, in a very fluid political situation, the contestation of different groups, of different interests, not only business interests, but also class interests. Uh, next, please. Okay, I think it's also important to remind ourselves, we can be very proud of the fact that perhaps we can, through some statistical manipulation, become a developed country very, very soon, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's important for us to re recognize where this growth is coming from. And it's important, not only the role of oil, but I think it's also important, and, 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 and the tax impact impact and uh, sorry the, the the point i want to, to make here is that how exchange rate policy has been extremely important in ensuring that that malaysian capitalism has been quite dynamic in in some crucial periods if you think about the period from 1988 up to 1997 part of that was precisely because you had a weakened ringgit a weakened ringgit, which made Malaysian exports much more, much more dynamic. It, I would not say, however, that there's any evidence that the more regressive income distribution due to the change of the tax structure from the mid-1980s was crucial to the, to the, to the growth, uh, to the growth uh, process. Now, the continuing regressiveness, the continuing growth of that regressiveness of the fiscal of fiscal policy, both on the tax side as well as uh, as on the spending side, is something which I think we should pay a lot of attention to. And unfortunately, we have very little discussion of public finance. The late James Puducherry wrote one of his 
few articles ever on the whole question of public finance, you know, six, five, six decades ago. And we, we do not have any very, you know, very um, informed debates on public finance issues uh, today. Prof. Jomo, if you could please round up because yes, we're yes, Chakra, very thank you. Um, I time. thought Sorry. By, by referring to you in more familiar terms, you would give me a break. But uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, let, let, let me, let me, let me, um, let me make, mm, there is one point which I missed out, and that is the huge underclass which we are in denial about. We have somewhere between six to seven million foreign workers working in this country for on wages for wages which are probably largely lower than than uh, and in working conditions largely lower what does all this mean so if we take them out of the denominator obviously we have reached, we are going to be reaching developed country status but once we take them seriously into the denominator then you, the whole story changes this is something which we need to discuss we need to come to terms with and to stop you know what how we resolve this issue I'm not sure, but I think this is very important. The remaining slides have to do with a very fundamental issue again. What do you do in a situation where rentiers are essentially in charge? Rontier, not just rentiers of any type, because there are all kinds of rentiers, but rentiers who, for whom basically the uh, rentiers able to restructure the economic, political, and administrative system, and what does it mean? For the, dynamis, for, for the dynamism of, of, the, of the country. If you have a situation where you are taking counter-cyclical policies, which are often necessary, but those counter-cyclical policies are basically providing jobs for the boys and, li and little more, then the efficacy of counter-cyclical policies is very fundamentally and severely compromised. So these are kinds of issues which, which we obviously need to, to, to think about. The fact that you have a weak industrial capitalist class and you have finance increasingly dominant, partly encouraged by, by the media, you know, partly encouraged by other factors, which I won't get into right now, all this basically, oh, sorry, next, next slide, sorry. Um, uh, all this basically has very huge implications. Finally, I think you'd really need uh, development policy in order to move forward what we what we and this I think is is industrial uh, next please yeah, sorry. Um, uh, sorry prof th th this, we really uh, have yeah, to yeah, yeah we're, I'm, I'm almost at the last slide but I think the the key point I want to make here is that we have one huge opportunity which we're missing out on and I hope our fr our French friends will be much more sympathetic to and that is the possibility of a new round of industrial policy involving the development of biodiesel. This is very important to Marrakesh, it's important to, 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 to uh, global warming, etc., etc. And, and I would simply say in the last slide, last slide, uh, Tansrino referred to pragmatism. I would also emphasize prioritizing the real economy, appropriate industrial policy, and to have a political settlement, a political settlement based on a nationalist consensus, not on ethnopopulism. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Prof. Jomo. So sorry to rush you.